in the UCAT, it's Article 208, Question 208, because I said we'll read it from there. So, uh, Kathleen, if you don't have it, just share it with Julie. 208. Now, as you know, as I've said, that in the UCAT you have question, answer, and explanation. And then in the answer you've got references in numbers to the big one, to the Catholic, to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So what is Holy Eucharist? Holy Eucharist is the sacrament in which Jesus Christ gives his body and blood himself for us so that we too might give ourselves to him in love and be united with him in holy communion. In this way, we are joined with the one body of Christ, the church. And so the numbers that you see after this refer you to the big one. Now, the big one, you can buy it, and I do advise you to buy it if you want to go beyond what UCAT says. UCAT says the, the gist, the most important aspect, but that is what, you know, if you want to find everything, you get, you buy this one also. Now, that one is about 20 bucks. It's not that expensive. It will not, you know, make you homeless to get it. As with a good Catholic Bible, you have one now. The Catechism, the full version, is very good. It's, it's excellent. But this one, if you read this one as we're trying to do this, you will know your Catholic faith. If you want to go, if you know it deeper and deeper, you go with this one. So what is Holy Eucharist? Holy Eucharist is the sacrament. Now we know that there are seven sacraments. Now, last week, we talked about, any good guess? What was last week's topic? Actually, baptism. baptism. So, last week we spoke about the first sacrament. The first um, divinely instituted, Jesus instituted um, ways, graces by which we can receive his life and he chose elements of nature as I said there's in a sacrament and the, the word sacrament is also called mystery remember I when I explained the word mystery there are lots of meanings to that word a mystery or sacred mystery is also the same thing as sacrament so there's in a sacrament two aspects. One visible, uh, water, oil, bread, you know, and one invisible. The invisible aspect of the sacrament is the most important one. So the invisible aspect is grace, sanctifying grace, the Holy Spirit. So in baptism, the element of water is what we see, what we touch, and it's the visible element. But when men and women, babies, adults are baptized, they are baptized in water that has been prayed over, consecrated, so that men and women, by being baptized, receive the inner grace, which means receive the Holy Spirit. Same thing with the with confession. Confession, when you go to confession, you use prayers, you confess your sins. And this is the, the audible, if you want the visible aspect, but it's the audible aspect when you confess your sins. And it, we call it, it's the, it is the matter of the sacrament. So confessing your sins to a priest is this audible aspect. But then when the priest gives you the forgiveness of your sins, we call it absolution, you receive the forgiveness of sins 
because of the Holy Spirit. Now the formula, the formulation of the absolution, when you, some of you may have already gone to confession, after you confess your sins, the priest says a few words of advice and counsel, and then he gives you penance. Penance is a sign of your reconciliation. You've got, you've got to repair in a certain way what you have done through your sin. So penance is a sign of your reconciliation with God. And then the priest asks you to say your act of contrition. That means to proclaim that you have sinned, that you have regretted, that you have hurt God by doing so because God is love. And that you promise not to repeat it. You promise that with, with the strength and the grace of God, you won't repeat sin. And finally, the priest gives you the absolution and he says, God the Father of mercies, through the death and the resurrection of Jesus his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace, and I forgive you, I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, absolution is, is the heart, what we call the substance of the confession. So, when you confess your sins, that's the audible aspect, you receive the forgiveness of your sins by the Holy Spirit, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Same thing with the with the, the Eucharist. The Eucharist, you know, remember that um, uh, <coughs> at the second part of Mass, which is called the Liturgy of the Eucharist, before that, we'll talk about this next in January, but we can also mention it. The first part of Mass is called the Liturgy of the Catechumens, which means now we call it Liturgy of the Word. But it's the part of the Mass where the non-baptized, those who want to become Catholics, can attend. So it has the priest welcomes by signing, by making the sign of the cross, and then calls the faithful to, uh, you know, to, to pray for the forgiveness of their sins, not the mortal sins, not the serious sins, but the sins that we call venial, that are not... Uh, not serious or not mortal. And so after this, we there's usually on Sunday we sing the Gloria, the prayer, beautiful prayer, glory to God in the highest. And then the priest prays the opening prayer. And then there's the Word of God. The Word of God usually taken from the Old Testament. And then there's a psalm. Then the second reading from St. Paul usually, or St. John, from the second, <coughs> from, the, sorry, from the New Testament, and finally the Gospel. After the Gospel, the priest preaches, says, a hom gives a homily. In the past, they, it used to be called sermon. Sermon because the priest could preach on anything. But after the Council, the Second Vatican Council, it was called homily because the priest now always preaches from the word, from the gospel usually, and then he can expand. So after this, we say, all of us, the I believe in God and the prayers of the faithful, we pray for the whole world, and then the non-baptized are dismissed, They're, they leave. After they leave, because they haven't yet been baptized, therefore, they, they cannot participate in the liturgy of the Eucharist. So after they are baptized, they can obviously participate in the whole mass. At the beginning of the liturgy of the Eucharist, the faithful, some faithful bring bread and wine. Again, a visible element taken from nature, bread and wine. And the priest receives the bread and wine, elevates them, 
ask the Holy Spirit to come on them and repeat the words of Jesus at the Last Supper. And then the miracle of the bread becoming the body of Christ, the wine becoming the blood of Christ, takes place. And we call this with a technical word, transubstantiation. But we'll explain it next, next month. But what I'm trying to say is that sacrament has always two elements. One that is visible, taken from nature. This afternoon I went to Burnaby Hospital. I went to anoint someone who's very sick, who may be dying, to anoint him with the sacrament of the sick and to hear his confessions, to hear his confession and to give him the Holy Communion, the Eucharist. And this is what we call the last rites. Somebody who is dying, who is still conscious, receive those sacraments. And so, for the anointing of the sick, we use oil, olive oil, you know, extra virgin oil. So the best quality of olive oil. And once a year, on Holy Thursday, during what we call the Chrism Mass, the Archbishop, you know, prays over three different kind of oil. You know, he asks the Holy Spirit again to come on those three kinds of oils. They're all olive oil, but one of them will be used for the healing of the sick, for the strengthening and healing of the sick. The other one, it is for the, it's called the oil of the catechumens. And those who are not baptized will receive the oil of the catechumen. And so and that oil helps the one who wants to be baptized and become a Catholic, strengthens him, strengthens him or her inwardly. You know, that's the oil of the catechumen. And finally, the most important oil, we call it holy chrism. And so the, um, the uh, bishop prays on those three oils. And, you know, and the holy chrism is used for baptism, for confirmation, and for the sacrament of holy orders for the men who are called to become priests. And so it's very beautiful, this uh, celebration of the bishop during, it's called the Chrism Mass, because before praying over the three oils, he adds to the oil, you know, the big containers with a, a big spoon, he adds perfume, lavender, he, he adds perfume so that it could, um, uh, you know, be uh, perfumed, you know, so you don't only, you're not only receiving oil, which is the, the ele important element, but it's an oil that also smells nice. So, again, this is a reminder of what, what a sacrament is. So, Holy Eucharist is the sacrament in which Jesus Christ gives his body and blood. And that's where we use bread and wine. Now, what makes the bread and wine become the body, and blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, the total Christ? What makes this, what accomplishes this miracle? Two things. The Holy Spirit. We pray the Holy Spirit. The priest prays that the Holy Spirit comes and repeats and says the words that Jesus said when he instituted the Eucharist on Holy Thursday before getting arrested on Good Friday. Jesus, with his disciples, went to the upper room. What he did, he washed their feet, and then he took bread and wine and, you know, prayed this prayer. We thank God, the Father, he blessed him, and, and then he says, this is my body, this is my blood. And so, on Holy Thursday, Jesus instituted the Eucharist, and he said to the apostle, the twelve apostle, do that, do this in memory or in remembrance of me. 
So he made them, he ordained them priests so that they can perform, accomplish the sacrament of the Eucharist. So what's the purpose according to uh, UCAT? So that we too might give ourselves to him in love. He gives us his body and blood in order for us to give ourselves to him and be united in, with him in Holy Communion. When we receive him, you know, we are united to him in love and we give ourselves to him. And when we give ourselves to him, we are members of the church. We become more united to him. He is the head of the church. Well, we are united to his body. His body also is our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, if you notice, there's a commentary. The commentary is very important. It says, after baptism and confirmation, we're going to talk about confirmation next month, and this is where we need to change the order. We need to talk about baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, and Holy Mass, uh, one after the other. So, after baptism and confirmation, the Eucharist is the third sacrament of initiation of the Catholic Church. See, when adults are uh, become Catholics, they first are baptized and then they're confirmed with this holy oil called Holy Chrism, and then they receive the Eucharist, the body blood of Christ. And by so doing, they become members of the Church. The Eucharist is the mysterious center of all these sacraments. The Eucharist, we call it the source. It's the center. The source and the summit. It's everything is contained in the Eucharist. Because when we are going to talk about Mass, you'll realize that the Eucharist, although one of seven sacraments, is the most important one. It's, the church calls it fonts, the source and the summit of the, our Christian life. Now, the Eucharist is the mysterious center of all these sacraments because the historic sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is made present during the words of consecration in a hidden, unbloody manner. Thus, the celebration of the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. Everything aims at this. Besides this, there is nothing greater that one could attain. When we eat the broken bread, we unite ourselves with the love of Jesus, who gave his body for us on the wood of the cross. When we drink from the chalice, we unite ourselves with him, who even poured out his blood out of love for us. We did not invent this ritual. Jesus himself celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples and therein anticipated his death. He gave himself to his disciples under the signs of bread and wine and commanded them from then on, even after his death, to celebrate this Eucharist, the Eucharist, do this in remembrance of me. Now there's a beautiful quotation, that's what is very nice about the UCAT. On the left and the right margins, there are quotes, quotations, of uh, saints, of martyrs, of, the, of popes. But there's also a dictionary, as I told you before. So, in, uh, there's a quote of St. John Marie Vianney, no, not St. John, yeah, but this is not about the Eucharist. Um, there's a quote of St. Thomas Aquinas. The actual effect of the Eucharist is the transformation of man into God. Now what St. Thomas is saying, when you receive the body and blood of Christ, you receive him into you. You're united with him and you receive his grace and you become like him. 
you be you you'll receive a sanctifying grace that will make you become Christ-like. And that what he's meaning. What's, this is what he's meaning. And you've got all sorts of quotes in the Holy Eucharist of St. Francis de Sales. We become one with God like food with the body. And Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, she says, your life must be woven around the Eucharist. Direct your eyes to him who is the light. Bring your hearts very close to his divine heart. Ask him for the grace to know him, for the charity to love him, for the courage to serve him. Seek him longingly, long for him. So, the Eucharist has three dimensions. St. Thomas mentions them, St. Thomas Aquinas. We'll explain what Eucharist means. <clears throat> now, St. Thomas says that the Eucharist, <coughs> he calls it sacred banquet. Now, we will see that the Eucharist will, has many names. St. Thomas calls it sacred banquet in which Christ is consumed. Christ is eaten, consumed. And then St. Thomas says the memory of his passion The memory of his passion recalled. So I should be. I should be. I'll leave this here. Okay. So the memory of his passion is recalled. Our soul is filled with grace. And then, and our pledge of future glory, our pledge of future glory received. So I'll try to explain this. Now, the heart of you, the Eucharist is to receive Jesus, to receive him. He said in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have eternal life, will never die, and I will raise him, or I will raise her up, raise them up on the last day. So the heart of the Eucharist is Christ is consumed. I mean, we're receiving, we're eating even the body of Christ, drinking his blood. Now, uh, this might sound, uh, you know, too, too hard to take. When Jesus asked his disciple, when Jesus told his disciple, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have eternal life. They had, he had many followers. He said, this is too hard to hear. And many left him except his 12 apostles. And Jesus told him, told them, are you, are you going to leave too? And Peter said to him, Peter, where, Lord, where, where can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. So even back then, when Jesus says, you got to eat my body and drink my blood, some people found it too hard and they left him. But this is the heart of the faith of the church, that God loved us so much, so passionately, that in his son, he gave us a way to be so united with him so that he can fill us with his love. You know, and there's, 
no stronger way of being united with God than to eat Him, to eat His body and blood. Now we will remember that here we're talking about Jesus crucified the humanity and Jesus is risen from the dead. So we're not eating raw meat here, you know. We're eating Jesus truly and really and what the church says substantially, but he is risen from the dead. And, you know, so when, when we say that we're eating his body and drinking his blood, it is true, but Jesus is risen from the dead. We're not eating meat here. Otherwise, we would be, uh, uh, you know, flesh eaters. We would be uh, cannibals. Jesus is not talking here about cannibalism. This is a way of Jesus giving himself truly to us by receiving his body and blood. And his body is real food. His blood is real drink. But Jesus, let's always remember, we're eating and drinking the risen body and blood of Christ. And so, in this way, he wants to unite us to himself, to unite us with each other in his church, and fill us with his love. So, what... St. Thomas Aquinas says that the heart of the Eucharist is when we, when Christ is consumed by us, when we receive, when we eat his body and drink his blood in Holy Communion. Now there are three dimensions to the Eucharist. When we, when in, when we read God's word, you know, and then when the priest repeats, says the words of Christ at the Last Supper, you know, he took bread, he gave thanks to God the Father, and he said, this is my body, this is my blood. And when he took the wine again, he gave thanks, and this is my blood uh, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. We are remembering, we are going back to the cross. You know, Jesus is anticipating his death on the cross. So when we receive him in the Holy Eucharist, we go back in a certain way, mysteriously, we are with the apostles when he gives them his body and blood. But also we are at the foot of the cross with Mary and John, the, the faithful disciple, and the two other Marys. We're there in mystery. The church always used this, uses this expression, in mystery. Now, we're there uh, because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, it's an, it's an, it's, and it's an eternal moment where when we enter this mystery, we're kind of transported back into the past. But the past becomes present, present to us. So we are witnesses with the apostles uh, of the institution of the Eucharist. And we are. We are with the three women, with Mary, with, with John at the foot of the cross. And so... The memory of his passion is recalled. So we're, we're, we're remembering, but remember that the word memory, you know, here it's not just we're remembering a past event. It, it is, but it's much more than remembering a past event. That past event becomes present to us in mystery. So it's not just, oh, you know, I, you know, I, get, I get together with my, with, uh, uh, my uh, fellow students, you know, we had the same graduation every year. We get together, we party, we remember the good old times when we were university students. We're not talking about only this. We're talking about living the past 
which becomes present to us in mystery. In mystery, it's not in, in our imagination. It's true. It's, it's a faith presence to Christ. And that faith present, that what brings this event of the past, makes it present again, is the Holy Spirit. So, the memory of Jesus' passion, you know, his, his passion when he agonized before he got arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took with him three, the, three of his apostles, the leaders, you know, Peter, James, and John, he said, come with me, let's pray for an hour. And then, you know, they, 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 they slept, they fell asleep. He said, you can't just be with me for an hour. And then he started, you know, shedding uh, sweat of blood, you know. And he, 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 it's as if the whole uh, sin of the world from Adam to the last human being crushed him. You know, he, he carried all the weight. And he said, if, if you could remove Father, you know, this is Jesus so human. He says, if, if you could take this cup, that means this suffering. If you can take this cup from me, Father. But then he said, but not my will, but your will be done. So he accepted to suffer, and then, you know, he was, he went to, uh, with his 12 disciples, the upper, uh, upper room, washed their feet, and then um, instituted the Eucharist with God, and got uh, betrayed by, by Judas, arrested and tortured. The passion, the passion, passion means the, the suffering of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then when he was arrested, flogged, tortured, uh, crown of thorns carrying the cross, going to the hill of Golgotha outside Jerusalem, being crucified and dying the cross. That's the passion of Christ. So in the Eucharist, the memory of his passion is recalled. As I said, by remembering, by remembering his passion, it is made present to us. In mystery. And then the second dimension of the Eucharist, our soul is filled with grace. You know, when we receive Jesus in Holy Communion, when we eat his body, drink his blood, of course, our soul, our heart, our whole being is filled with grace. God's love for us. You know, we totally, we don't merit this. But he still fills us with his love. He fills us with the fire of his spirit. So our soul is filled with grace. And then Jesus says, remember, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will never die. I will raise him up on the last day. So when we receive Jesus, it is also a guarantee that one day we will experience future glory, which means heaven. We're called to heaven. And this is how, this is when it's so, uh, it's so horrible when people go to Mass and they have serious sins in their hearts and immortal sins and, you know, and nothing changes. It is what we call sacrilege. It's horrible because, you know, those three dimensions, you know, we, when we receive him, we're transported in the past. That past is made present in mystery. We are there with Jesus, you know, agonizing the Garden of Gethsemane. We're there with Jesus instituting the Eucharist, washing the feet of his disciples. We're there also when at the foot of the cross, Mary, everybody has fled except his mother, except John, and two other Marys behind him were there. So the memory of his passion is recalled. Our soul, when we receive him, we're filled with his life, we're filled with his love, we're filled with his grace. We want to be like him. 
He's in us, we are in Him. And He's calling us to be like Him, to be saints. We're filled with all grace. We're filled with grace. And then it is as if we're transported during Mass when we receive Him. We're transported into heaven. And that's why many Catholic saints throughout the history called Mass or the Eucharist heaven on earth. We have a pledge, a guarantee of future glory. And this is why Mass is so awesome. It is the greatest of the seven sacraments. And that's why the church calls it the source and the summit of our Christian life. I mentioned it is, um, it is the most important sacrament. It is really where we receive everything. Um, and that's why we call it also the sacrament of the real presence of Christ. And this is where, for example, it is where um, we have a very different understanding of the other Christian denominations. You know, um, the only church, which is not a denomination, is the only church that has an understanding of the Eucharist that is very close to us is the Orthodox Church. You know? and, but the other Christian denominations, uh, like the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the Evangelicals, they do not have the same understanding of the Eucharist. Because first, they don't have priesthood. Right? We, that's, you know, one day we can explain that. And, um, and so, with the Anglicans and the Lutherans, they celebrate the Eucharist, but the priesthood, they, they don't have a priesthood, so it's, um, there's no real presence of Christ because there's no true priesthood. So anyways, this is called the real presence of Christ because we receive Jesus as the teaching of the church tells us. We, he is really truly and substantially present in the Eucharist. So this is to emphasize how real Jesus is when we, we come to receive him in Holy Communion, eat his body, drink his blood. We receive him fully. That means his divinity, his humanity, you know, his life, death, and resurrection, we receive all of Jesus. Of course, you know, as I sometimes mention, if, you know, uh, for those who have no faith, you're receiving a, a bread, a piece of bread. And especially when we after Mass, often we place Jesus on the altar, which is called the Exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. We place him in a container called Monstrance that looks like uh, the sun sending its rays all over the world. And we place him in the place of his body uh, in, a, uh, in a glass container. We call it Pix. Uh, or, uh, and you know, Protestants say, well, Catholics are crazy, they adore the bread, but they don't understand that we do not adore the bread. We adore the bread of life, Jesus Christ, truly present in, in the Eucharist. So this is, there's a very big difference between our understanding of, of the Eucharist. Now, because, you know, we are really present when Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice. Now, the Eucharist is the representation of the death of Jesus 
on the cross of Calvary. Now, Jesus, as one of the letters, the letter to the Hebrews says that Jesus gave his life on the cross, Calvary Hill, once and for all. He gave his life once and for all. And so the Eucharist is the representation of the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. But the, the difference is that the sacrifice of Christ on the Calvary once and for all was a bloody sacrifice. It was a violent sacrifice, you know. Whereas the representation in the Eucharist of the sacrifice of Jesus in Calvary is unbloody. That means there is no killing again of Jesus. You know, there's no violence the unbloody representation of the sacrifice of Calvary offered once and for all. Now, the Eucharist, it is like, uh, it, it's, it, it's like when, when the priest offers the Eucharist, Holy Mass, it's like um, taking the sacrifice of Calvary, you know, very bloody, and applying it in space and time in an unbloody way, in a nonviolent way. So it is, it is bringing the one sacrifice of Calvary and applying it <coughs> in time and space. It's like, you know, um, you know, if, if I can picture it, that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary has, um, you know, given a, a sort of a, a wave of energy. Now, I'm, I'm using only images here. And every time the priest offers Mass, taps into this energy and brings it, you know, in time and space. So he brings the sacrifice that took place historically on the hill of Calvary, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, brings it in time and space here and there. And so that, so that this sacrifice could uh, be offered until Jesus, when he comes in glory. So it can always be uh, offered. Why, why did Jesus offer himself on the cross? Why did Jesus sacrifice himself on the cross? In order to bring his life, his salvation, to all. And that is why the Mass, the Eucharist, is always offered in order to... Um, Again, allow men and women to enter into the salvation that Jesus gave us on Calvary Hill, on the cross. Now, it's every time you, you participate in Mass, every time you are with other brothers and sisters and the priest is celebrating Mass, this is the heart of the church, you know. The church, there is no church without the Eucharist. And that's why, strictly speaking, Protestant denominations are not considered churches because they don't have a Eucharist. The church is, you know, the whole people of God gathers around the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, by when Jesus gives himself to his brothers and sisters, he makes them united together in love, and that is the church. So the church, the definition, one of the definitions of the church is the gathering of men and women who believe in Christ, in his death and resurrection, ascension into heaven. 
and who are gathered around the Eucharist. And the first priest who offers the Eucharist is the bishop. So the church is the people of God, men and women, in a place, given place, you know, that are gathered around the Eucharist and united to the bishop of the diocese. And that bishop himself is united to the first among the bishops. That means the bishop of Rome, the pope. So that is the church. So what is the Eucharist? What is Mass? Is You've got those three dimensions that are very important. And the Mass is the representation. Sometimes we use the word perpetuation of the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. Remember that Mass, the Mass is not uh, the only difference with the sacrifice of Calvary is Jesus is not killed. He has offered himself once and for all. We receive it in Holy Communion. We receive his body and blood. And that is why the Eucharist is a sacrifice. And this is why oftentimes we hear the word, the sacrifice, the holy sacrifice of Mass. It is a sacrifice because it's Jesus offering himself to all for the salvation of the world. And when we receive him, we unite ourselves with him and we become ambassadors. We become, so to speak, agents of the salvation, of the fullness of life that he has come to give to all. That is why it's so important that people believe in Christ and come into the church so that they can participate in the Eucharist. So the Eucharist is a sacrifice. The Eucharist is a sacred banquet. Sometimes you hear the priest or you read in books the banquet of the Eucharist. It is, um, everyone is invited. Everyone who, who has received Christ is invited to his banquet. And Jesus gives himself totally to us. And that mass, this Eucharist that we celebrate on earth is um, a sort of a, an announcement, a foretaste of what we're going to live in heaven. The heaven in heaven, we're going to have a full banquet. You know, we're going to have Jesus Himself, you know, fully visible to us. We're going to see Him. We're going to touch Him. We're going to not there in heaven. There will not be faith anymore because faith he is here on earth, but in heaven. There, is, there will be no faith, no hope. There will be love because we will Jesus, see Jesus face to face. So it's a sacred banquet. It's also called divine liturgy. It is the public act of worship of Catholics that act of worship is divine in the sense that God himself becomes present and gives himself to us in his body and blood. It's the divine liturgy. Now, in the Gospels, it's called the Last Supper. Last Supper. In the book of Acts, it's called the Breaking of the Bread. And then it came to be known in the West, in the Latin church, the church that we belong to, it, it became known as Mass or Holy Mass. Because from, from uh, the 4th 
the middle of the third century, around the fourth century, the liturgy in the West became Latin. It was in Latin. Before that, it was celebrated in Greek because Greek was the language of the empire, but Latin became more and more. And so around the fourth century, uh, the church was celebrated, the, the Eucharist was celebrated in Latin. And the last word that the priest says after he gives you the final blessing, it is in Latin, Ite. He says, <coughs> Ite, Nisa es, which means, Go, you are sent. Misa means sent. You are like ambassadors. And the last word of Mass celebrated in Latin became, this, became the name of all the Mass. And so Misa, which meant you're sent, you know, after the priest gives the final blessings, then he'd say, go, you are sent. You are now ambassadors of what you have received. You know, like we say in, in English, go in peace or go, go and glorify the Lord by your lives. In Latin, it's ite misa est, which means go, you are sent to be Christ in the world, to be his ambassadors. So the word misa came to describe the whole celebration. And so this is why uh, now we speak about Holy Mass, Mass. I'm going to Mass <laughs> on Sunday because it came from this Ite Misaest, Go, you are sent. So sometimes you may, you may uh, come across the expression mystical, mystical banquet, sacred or mystical banquet. And mystical refers to mystery. It means we are celebrating the, the sacrifice of Jesus who gives himself to us in mystery. That means in, in, in the reality of the, the, the faith, the Holy Spirit present to us. He's giving to us himself in sacrament, in mystical banquet. So, the, the word Eucharist comes from the very word of Jesus because in the Gospels who came to us written in Greek, Jesus, when he gathers his, um, his apostles, washes their feet, and then takes bread and wine, it says in Greek, he gave thanks. And the word <coughs> to give thanks in Greek is Eucharistian, you know, and then he blessed, the word blessing is eulogain, so Eucharistian, which means giving thanks, so the celebration of, of the Lord's Supper became known as Eucharist, which means giving thanks, thanksgiving. Now, thanksgiving for what? Now, Jesus, when he instituted the Eucharist, he gave thanks to his Father. He gave, him, he gave thanks to him that he sent Jesus, his Son, to give his life on the cross as a sacrifice to save all men and women. So, when we give thanks, when we are, when we go to Mass, when we're participate in the Eucharist, we unite ourselves to Christ, who is giving thanks to his Father, that he sent his Son to be a sacrifice so that everyone will be saved for the salvation of the world. So we give thanks for the gift of Jesus by the Father to be our salvation. So this is why the Eucharist is the sacrament of also thanksgiving, giving thanks. It's not just, hi, thank you, Daniel. You've been good. No, 
Thank you, Kathleen. No, it's, it's much more than that. It's giving thanks to the Father that He gave us His Son, that He loved us so much that He gave us His Son who loved us unto death and is dying on the cross. We are representing this death on the cross of Jesus during Mass. So we give thanks for what Jesus did and is doing every Mass in order to bring everyone to experience this abundant life. But it's not automatic. When, we, when the priest says at the end of Mass, go and glorify the Lord by your lives. Be the ambassadors of Christ of what you have received. It means let others know about Jesus in your life, in your words, by your attitude, so that everyone will come to know him. Everyone will come to his church and participate in his life-giving sacrament, especially in the Eucharist. So um, I think right now that's enough for today. It's, it's uh, a lot. Next, in January, we will deepen our knowledge of the Eucharist and we'll speak about Mass, every part of Mass. And besides, there are some who are away, and the Eucharist is absolutely essential to understand. And so, it is now a nearly a quarter to nine. We have, there's room for maybe two or three questions. Anybody wants to ask a question? so that we can experience the fullness of his love. We cannot understand. We just thank him for the gift of his son. We thank him for the Eucharist. It's not that, you know, when you put yourself into the shoes of God, you're a human being, you know, and God is God. And, you know, when you think about God, well, we talked about, you know, in the first two, three meetings that God is creator, God is almighty, God is all powerful, God is, you know, uh, you know, we are tiny pieces of dust, you know, and yet uh, we want to understand that that's normal because God has given you and given me intelligence, the gift of intelligence, but it's, it's beyond our understanding. God's love is so great, so awesome. This is why I sometimes use the word extravagant, you know. It's beyond my understanding. What I know of God's love makes me want to adore Him. He wants to say, thank you, God. Who am I that you manifested so much love for me? So when we realize how incredible, how, how immense God's love is, that you as a parent, it's impossible for you to offer your son. See, Paul says, well, sometimes you can at least, you never die for someone else, but there are instances where people died for other people. Like, you know, when you when you start uh, reading about the saints, there's one saint called Saint Maximilian Kolbe. He was a wonderful, 
Franciscan priest. He was from Poland. He also was a missionary in Japan uh, before the war, Second World War. Then he came back to Poland, and Poland, of course, was invaded by the Nazis. And the Nazis, the Germans, the Nazi arrested the Jews, of course, and sent them to extermination camps, and also many Catholics, many Catholics, priests, and sisters, and nuns. And so Father Maximilian Kolbe was arrested. And in Auschwitz, which is <coughs> the most horrible extermination camp, they, the, the officer said, well, get together. We're going to pick up who to kill, who to send to the gas chamber. So Father Maximilian was one, and there was a group of, of men. Men and women were segregated. And so one of the men who was picked was a father of six children. And so Father Maximilian said, Officer, you know, he's got six children. Can I take his place? So there are people, and Father Maximilian Kolbe, he sacrificed himself in order to save this father who had six children. So there are, in history, people who would sacrifice themselves in order to bring life to others. As, you know, in, like the example of Christ. But Christ said he gave his life not for good people, gave his life for everyone, for the, for the sinners, for the impious, for the murderers, for all of us. All of us have sinned. You know, remember original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. And from even back then, God has promised that one day he will bring us back to him. And so he sent his son. And Jesus did not die for the good. You know, he didn't say, well, Gabriel, you're so smart. I will die for you. Or he didn't say, Daniel, you're so handsome. I'll die for you. No. All of us, all of us were sinners. And all of us deserved, because we had absolutely rejected God, deserved to be sent to hell. But yet, God decided, because of his love, to save all by, by sending his son. And Jesus did not go to Calvary. Oh, I hate it, Father. I hate it. No. He said, here am I. I come to do your will, Father. Of course, his humanity, you know, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he was arrested, he says, well, if you can take the suffering from me, Father. But then he said, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus offered himself freely. Uh, and in doing so, he, on the cross, he gave salvation to everyone. Now this salvation, this fullness of life is not automatic. Like, you got to believe in Christ, to enter into it. Now the question arises, what if people in, in Africa or in, in the far corners of China or whatever, never heard about Christ? They never heard about Christ. Will they be saved? Well, the church says that on Calvary, Jesus died for everyone. And those who never heard about Christ, but who lived according to their conscience, can be saved. And if they're saved, it's because of Jesus dying for everyone. But those who, you know, now that with, with the internet everywhere, you hear about Christ, there's, there's all sorts of deceptions and lies. So what I'm trying to say is that the church says that if you've never ever heard about Christ, and you're living according to your conscience, you can be saved. But it's not easy. But this is where, as Catholic Christians, we're called to be witnesses so that to bring others to that personal relationship with Christ, that knowledge of Christ, bring them back to the church so that they could know him, love him, and serve him. So, um, as a parent, I, I, of course, you can, you can never do it. Uh, but there are, as I said, 
examples in the history <coughs> of humanity where I gave you the example of Father Maximilian Kolbe, who became Saint Maximilian Kolbe, who gave his life in order to save that father of six children. Any other questions? Last question. One, two, three, four, five, six. <coughs> okay, so you look tired and sleepy, Sam's. And uh, thank you very, very much for coming again. And so I, I highly encourage you to read from UCAP. Go to the index. Read. Read, think about the answers, look at the quotations, read them, look, learn the vocabulary. It's very important. UCAP is very attractive. Pray the rosary now that you have your booklet. Pray. And when you pray, pray for the members of your family. Pray for yourself that you will have that greater desire to know, to know the faith. And knowing the faith is not only an intellectual knowledge, it is, but it's a lifestyle, a whole life. You know, I don't believe in Jesus Christ only on Sunday, uh, and then I forget about him six days, six days, no, no. When I believe in Jesus Christ, he becomes the center of my life, the Lord. And this is why I talk with him every day. I have a daily conversation with him. I read his word. I learn about Him, and I try to be like Him wherever I am. Now, I may not succeed, and I don't, and sometimes I sin. But that is why I go to confession, too. You don't think that a priest never goes to confession. The priest goes to confession maybe more, because, you know, he's called to be what we call alter Christus, another Christ, you know. So this is, so I do encourage you to pray the rosary. I do encourage you to pray for the members of your own family, for your friends. I encourage you to pray that you become filled with this love of Christ in you. So that people who look at you say, what's going <laughs> on in your life? How come you're more patient? How come you, you don't get hurt that easily? How come you don't lash back? You know, you don't punch back those, you know, say, well, something has changed. Yes. Coming to know Christ, love Him more. What? Are you crazy? Are you for real? Yes, I am. And I, would you like me to pray with you? Oh, yes, yes. You know, today my boss was so nasty with me at work. I hate him. Could you please pray for me? Because I, I have a turmoil. I hate this woman. You know, she is so bossy. I love to gossip about her with my colleague. Would you pray with me? And you start praying with her. And you know she finds peace. And then she says, Well, tell me about, tell me about your faith. Maybe I could go with you uh, to Mass on Sunday. Would you invite me? Of course you say, yes. Everybody is welcome. You come. And you get to know. So you become witnesses. That's the beauty of our faith. So now that you are nearly asleep, I will release you. <coughs> God bless you all and have a very, very happy Christmas. <laughs>